And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, making his triumphant return after 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 a after a year in, well, wherever he was. New York. <laughs> and and Creed. The man who the man who previously we knew as the as the man behind Saint Tommy as well as a bunch of other works, and is now making his venture into science fiction with the upcoming White Ops. The one and only the man who I put too many ends in his last in his name last time, the Clan Finn. How you doing today, man? I'm doing all right for well, being stuck in New York City. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, yeah. W- there's some there's some jokes I could make about it, but it but it'd be pretty. A- Don't worry, any joke you can make, I've probably made worse. Um. Well, I can I can I can sympathize because that means that means you'll have to deal with one with one of the worst plagues in the history of mankind, Yankees fans. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yankees fans and Knicks fans. Yes, it's not so much the teams that are the problem. I just ignore them. Uh, the the real problem is when the fans decide to treat everybody else like the untermensch. It's like, dude, really, it's just baseball, uh, or it's just a sport. Go away. <laughs> oh, it certainly is. But I would be lying if I said I didn't. I didn't relish when I see the fan bases of teams t- talk all the crap about how they're the best, and then they end up getting humbled by actual teams. Yes. Oh, the, the amount of Yankees fans whining this week over the Mets are spending millions of dollars hiring new talent. It's like, I'm sorry, are they not supposed to hire people? <laughs> um, there's a list of... You're, pro, you're, from, you're familiar with the old phrase gla, about people in glass houses, right? Oh, yeah. Let's not, cause let's not forget the Yankees had got, got dragged into a hearing a decade ago about, about overspending. <laughs> like, yeah. Small market teams like where like where I come from, there there's reason to talk about that whole thing. But the pinstri but the pinstripes have no room on that. <laughs> it's just it's just that now all that because of the fact that everybody has gotten wise to gotten wise to those tactics. Um, you can't just throw money around and ex- and expect to buy your way into a championship. Yeah, well, hey, it only worked for them for what twenty years. Yeah, but event again, eventually, pe- eventually, people get wa- people get wise to the whole thing, mm. and well, not only not only that, but people, are, but you've got teams that are not only spending but spending smart. Oh yeah, yes. My my one of my closest friends is a Mets fan, and after a while, I just smile and nod at at the whole situation. I like I like the Mets. No matter what, no matter what I say to, no matter what I say about them, I never feel bad. I even I even wrote a song called "Beat the Mets" because I, because, as my mentor once said, I'm not trying to hit a man while he's down. I'm trying to kick him because that's easier. Yeah, you don't have to reach down as far. <laughs> no. Oh. But. I'd like, but shifting shifting away from that. I did a bit of I did a bit of checking just to make sure I wasn't going to be talking out of my ass about this, but I could not I could not find an aside from the weirder end of things, but I could not find any instance of you doing a full on book or in this case book series that is in the genre of science fiction. Th- this is true. Um, this, so this my... is your first foray. What? What sparked the move to what sparked the venture into science fiction for White Ops? Uh, White Ops was actually my first writing project uh, when I was sixteen, and uh, when I started writing, it was I made the mistake of not researching writing. So uh, I, I figured, okay, every book is somewhere between three fifty. 420 pages, give or take, you know. So um, I went out of my way, wrote books. I, you know, I was watching 
you know, Babylon 5 and Reed and David Weber. Um, this was before John Ringo and some of the other Bay and crew came on. And, uh, you know, I, so every book wound up being over 350, somewhere around four, four somewhere around 400 plus um, problem. I didn't know at the time that you're supposed to double space pages. <laughs> and uh, the margins are supposed to be one inches all around instead of the default setting of like 0.7 inches. <laughs> so, um, no, nor did I know that you were supposed to count words when you're judging the length of your project. So, uh, by the time I was done, after 15 months, I probably had somewhere north of 4,000 pages uh, in proper uh, punctuation actually done. So, uh, that was interesting and i've been banging it out uh trying to bang out all the kinks in it for the last 25 years mm -hmm. so i figured okay i can't hit i can't hammer out any more kinks so i gave it to uh tuscany bay which is uh my current publisher sorry my other publisher mm -hmm. i have two right now <laughs> i have to make sure to keep the shells moving and um to my surprise, because after you work on one project uh, for a certain amount of time, it's less a matter of, I can fix this, or I think it's perfect, and more a matter of, I have no idea what else to do with this. Here, you try it. <laughs> so, and much to my surprise, they liked it, so... Books one, two, and three are coming out uh, January, February, and March. And uh, we'll see how the other nine go down the line. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I've got up to book six drafted. So we'll, we'll see how uh, taking the sledgehammer to the rest goes over time. Oh, well, when... But... Uh, hmm? When all you have is a hammer, all your problems look like nails. Or dented sheet metal. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it's, like I said, it was my first, uh, first real project. And uh, it was just time to, to, to really, to unleash it. Um, I've done several short stories within the universe uh, here and there. Uh, actually, uh, there was a planetary anthology series by also by tuscany bay mm -hmm. and uh three or four different short stories from that universe wound up in the anthology mm -hmm. well two or three of the anthologies really so um yeah but this is the first time the novels are seeing are, are seeing the light of day uh, although uh I'm going to be very interested to see if anybody catches on to the fact that one of the short stories in the anthology is literally chapter one of the first book. <laughs> yeah. Now, science fiction is a wide, wide, wide net to cast, if you'll forgive me for making a fishing reference. In Go my ahead. defense, I'm still Minnesotan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but... What I'm curious about is what particular angle within 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 um, science fiction you're particularly um, covering. Since again, there's a lot of there's a lot of ground to cover with just science fiction as a whole. Well, um, I'm shooting for space opera. Mm -hmm. uh, I've I, I you know how they usually wound up describing movies like you know it's X meets Y. Uh, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, the TV series Jag was Top Gun meets A Few Good Men or something along those lines. Uh, when I'm describing uh, white ops to people, I usually describe it as, well, if Babylon 5 were written as a Bayon project, uh, <laughs> which was pretty much most of my influences on both ends. Mm -hmm. um, granted, I took something a little bit too literally and ran with it. Uh, for example, my, uh, the, all right, one of the things from Babylon 5, the fighter called a Star Fury, was 
copyrighted and patented for the series. And NASA decided that it would be the perfect design for a space construction vehicle when they got around to it. And the general assumption, well, no, the creator of the series basically said, sure, you can have it, just call it Star Fury, like in the TV show. Mm -hmm. And all I could think was, all right, so if we take uh, the current trend of copyrights never expire, thank you, Disney, uh, they will be legally obligated to keep calling them Star Fury 300 years from now, um, which unfortunately led into a spiral of, you know, Weber-class starships, the walking tanks are hot, called Heinleins. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the uh, armored infantry units are, are called Spartan Sixes, things along those lines. <laughs> and there are some people going, "What? it's a, Spart a Spartan Six armor. What happened to the first five? We never heard of them. It's like, shh, copyright issues, don't ask. <laughs> you know, it, it's a bit of a running gag and... To be honest, I haven't asked the editor how much they kept of uh, the running gag because, I don't know, for all I know, lawyers will be involved. But uh, it's kind of like what I did to book three. And I haven't gotten the edits on that one back yet. And that will be hilarious because book three is called Main Street DOA. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'm particularly subtle, even if they took out the uh, name of the company. Uh, where the, the, the premise is for the entire series, I've got a collection of Knights Templar spec ops in mm -hmm. space. And by book three, they've gone through three or four minor wars and two big ones. And, you know, there's a problem when your boss is an alien. And when the boss goes, well, you've been through all these wars you've done all these missions things are going to quiet down now what are you going to do now and uh in the original draft my uh main character who is a smart ass says i'm going to go to disney planet <laughs> and the alien and, and the boss goes you know that's a very good idea i have heard good things about that you deserve a vacation it's like ah crap uh <laughs> And, you know, but uh, I, I managed to have uh, terrorists come to the rescue. They take over the planet and gives our hero something to do without going crazy and killing himself or others. Mm -hmm. You know, but like I said, it's a matter of what the editor thinks I can get away with. Yeah. And I don't want I don't want to I don't want to have you reveal anything that might that might give that might give a few lures some ideas because, well, you know, the whole thing. Speak the devil's name and he will appear. Oh yeah. <laughs> plus, I don't, plus, I'm not in the business of tempting the gods of irony. Amen. Ah, uh, but with, but um, it's interest. It's interesting that you br that you bring up the concept of um of space opera, since that is something that I've been in discussion about with with a fair few people, mainly 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 to try and. Try and un try and unlearn some expectations when it comes to space opera because unfortunately, a lot of people when they hear space opera they think they think one of the big two in science in science fiction and that's kind of underselling the genre. Um, so I'd like so I'd like to ask in that regard, what space opera means to you? What are what are some of the hallmarks of a genre like space opera, the, th the kind of things that set it apart from other forms of science fiction? Oh, grand scope, uh, a collection of interesting characters, and high stakes. Mm -hmm. uh, most people will not look at the original Buster Crab, um, Flash Gordon, and go, ooh, that's space opera, mainly because the you know if you're looking at it superficially, it's low budget. It doesn't look that grand, and the cast of characters doesn't expand it too much because, you know, they can only hire so many people at the same time. But uh, the original Flash Gordon pretty much was that. You had Lensman, mm -hmm. where, again, grand scope, characters, and high stakes. Mm -hmm. You know, so 
yeah, stuff like that. Um, I probably have wandered away because I don't even remember the question anymore. But the quest um, the question was on what on what science fiction means to you and what and what some of the things what some what some of the key factors are that separate it from other forms of science fiction. Oh. Um, pretty much that. They, they, heck, heck, they keep calling David Weber space opera, which, in his case, it's become, you know, game of starships with 500 characters you can't remember. He kind of spiraled. <laughs> he, pull, he pulled um, a Robert Jordan, I guess is that, I guess is one way to put it. Well, at least with David Weber, he lived to finish it. And, yeah, he. I will grant you, with like with Robert Jordan, there were books David Weber pulled that it's like, okay, we just spent five books covering the same time period and the plot has not progressed. What was the point? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I no, do not mistake me. I love David Weber, great guy, and the bulk of Honor Harrington, I do not regret. But the last, what, half dozen books after at all cost made me go, why am I reading this series again? So hopefully it's not, hopefully it's just me. Yeah. And as far as, as far as that goes, I liked it. I like David Weber as well, but, um, a ironclad rule we have, in, we have here in the temple is we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. Amen. <laughs> I may I may be an ass, but I'm an e but I'm an equal opportunity one, <laughs> and everybody gets everybody everybody gets the roast, and nobody gets special treatment. I mean, I I love wheel I love Wheel of Time, but I'm not I'm not afraid to ro to roast Robert Jordan over an open flame for adding way too many characters and turning his books into a tumbleweed. Yeah. Which hey, at least with Robert Jordan, he you know Robert Jordan had a good excuse. He was busy dying. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I've seen I've I've got I've gotten on, I've gotten on some some other authors for do, for doing the exact for doing the exact same thing. Although oddly and oddly enough, I see I seem to find more offenders in fantasy than I do in science than I do in science fiction. Um, but um, I don't recall if it was with the, with you that this that this was brought up or with, or with um another author, but. I do remember a discussion happening um, around last year about a, about, a, about an issue that's been going on for the longest time with science fiction of a overfocus, almost a fetishization on the technical part of it. Oh, well, I don't remember. I mean, I can't remember that far back, but yes, the I think har the... you're talking about the hard sci-fi contingent, which. Yeah. Okay. Fine. I think Hard the term I think the term you or somebody else came up with was large men with screwdrivers. Oh, that goes back decades. Um, look, there is to some degree. I don't mind hard sci-fi uh, as long as you're not making a fetish out of the technology. Damn it! Um, my friend Carl Gallagher writes mm -hmm. great books. Uh, he's done some sci-fi and some uh, fantasy and. By and large, he's not using any technology that you can't see from here. Uh, his Torch Ship trilogy was, yeah, basically uh, current day technology. You know, they, he had some hyperspace and you had people working out trajectories and math with an abacus. But he didn't, you know, spend so much time with the hardware that... He, he turned it into the, the uh, technical equivalent of latex and a whip. But, um, you know, so yeah, that kind of hard sci-fi where he's not relying too much on technology and he just used, you, he's using enough technology to make the plot move. That's one thing. If you're Isaac Asimov and you have so fallen in love with robotics and how things work, that you forget to make characters who have a personality, you get yourself a problem. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
seriously, I cannot remember a single character in Isaac Asimov outside of his Black Widower's mystery short stories. And I only recently learned that, yeah, they were entirely character based and driven because they were based off of people he knew. Which kind of helps when you don't have to work on developing character. You know them already. <laughs> although, the, although it could be just as easily argued that that's kind of cheating. And even, even as much as I love the foundation books, which I do, which I do, even though I, even though I think I think that trying to combine robots, empire, and foundation into one, in, into one meta into one meta narrative was a bad bad idea. Um. I have a hard time remembering remembering any remembering any characters beyond beyond Selden and the factions with it within the set within the setting. Exactly. And, well, that and the that and the mule, and that's not that's not exactly that's not exactly the strong the strongest pickings if that's the if that's the best I can get because. A lot of the emphasis is le is less on the characters and more on the interplay between factions. Hmm. Which there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that, but it is it is an it is an issue when it's when when you're try when you're trying to when you have to have a character's perspective be part of the writing. Like you can't just you can't just write it the same way you would a do a documentary thesis. Yeah, true enough. Uh, there was actually a book by Lou Antonelli, may he rest in peace, uh, called Another Girl, Ano Another Girl, Another Planet, mm -hmm. where his alternate history was what if Heinlein stayed with the U.S. Navy and he turned the Cold War into, instead of mutually assured destruction, it was an eternal space race. Mm -hmm. Which is why, you know, his char you know, the main character in 1984 meets this young guy named Putin on Mars, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not a matter of a lot of techie; it just change one thing. And I only bring it up because uh, Heinlein brought in this young mathematics professor named Asimov, and. Yes, it turned into a very unfortunate incident down in Cuba that involved the robots not reacting well to the three laws. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and after the robot mutiny was put down, uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that, speaking of Asimov, that brings me to what to one other thing that a lot that a lot of people a lot of people have had. Debates on regard regarding regarding science fiction, and since it's something that Asimov had a ha had a habit of putting, what's what's your opinion on on introducing um, mental abilities into science fiction? Well, I don't have a problem with mental abilities. In fact, one of my main characters in White Ops is a telepath, but it really depends on how you're using them and how you're developing them. Um, what, what, what are the limits? Mm -hmm. Because if you're using it like, oh, look, every Stephen King book has the telekinetic or the uh, psychic teenager or child who has no explanation for what her, his or her abilities are, it, it just becomes the deus ex machina. Yeah. Incidentally, that incidentally, the psychic kid is another part is one part in what's known as the Stephen King drinking game. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm familiar with it. You know, it's like, find the alcoholic, find the writer, find the atheist, find the evil, stupid, malicious Christian, uh, etc. Find the, find the cool, find the cool older brother, find the, find the childhood bully. Incidentally, mm. I, I want to put up a, I want to put up a disclaimer. If anyone tries the Stephen drinking game, we here in the monastery are not liable for any, for any alcohol related accidents or injuries. Or liver damage, or liver damage, or or um, being chased by angry mobs because you cause an alcohol shortage. Yeah, no kidding. And I'm not sure what would be worse: reading the books, or reading, or watching the movies. That's a good question. Yeah. The answer is yes. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I could just imagine somebody trying to do the drinking game with maximum overdrive. Um, I di I did. <laughs> oh, oh no! But you survived. I sur I survived only because I ran out of Jack. <laughs> and and it's a short movie. If I did, um, if I tried to do the Stephen King drinking game with the It miniseries, oh, no. I'd probably be dead. Twice. Yes. Yes. <laughs> You know, don't, don't do whatever you do. Do not have a shot every time there's a flashback. No, <laughs> I am. I am more. I am morally opposed to suicide. Oh, because that's basically yeah. what you're gonna get is death by alcohol oh, poisoning. Yeah. Um. Oh yeah. But I. But getting to getting to this. Um. Getting to the whole mental powers or psych or psychics or what have you. Um. If you had if you had to co if you had to collate it into a set of bullet points, what would be some general do's and don'ts? Do not have them be have do not have your uh, psychic person have unlimited abilities. Period. Uh, I have, and I'll go back to fantasy for a moment. Uh, in my Saint Tommy series, he winds up adopting a he winds up adopting a telekinetic teenager because. I do not find telekinesis or ESP too far out of the realm of possibility. Um, I know people who've had very minor experiences. Uh, and, and I don't mean telekinesis. I, I don't. But, um, but you know, throw that in. And the, the one of the first things I found I had a problem with is I need to put serious binders on what these the range of abilities are before this kid became the solution to every problem mm -hmm. you know and back in the book that's coming out uh which is for saint tommy which is book nine destiny uh it was taking place in italy so uh you know i, I wound up taking taking her out of play fairly early by needing to drop the uh arc it's not the Arc de Triomphe, but it's uh, a, the Italian version of it outside of the Colosseum, where it's, you know, basically drop the entire marble arch onto a Moloch statue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, okay, that's out. Okay, she's out of the game because, you know, after that it becomes headaches and nosebleeds or eye bleeds, which are even worse. Um, but you have to have some kind of limitation. Otherwise... There's no threat. You're, you're going to have one deus ex machina moment after another using the same exact answer. Um, one of the reasons why, you know, I, I, yeah, sure, I have a tele, I have a telepath, and the next thing I do right after introducing him is, how do I wind up making it not the solution to everything? Mm -hmm. And, you know, yes, you have to focus, no matter how strong a telepath you are. You can do passive listening, but if you're busy being shot at, you're not listening too closely to what you can hear with your mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> if you're going to do something along the lines of Stephen King, you know, if you're going to have your tele telepathic teenager uh, broadcast illusions, could you, for the love of God, introduce that factor earlier? as opposed to having it show up in the last 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm looking at the Longoliers, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um. it, which was one of those, another, another damn, it, another telepathic teenager, only she can do, she can do Lord of Illusions type stuff. And that came out of absolutely nowhere. Which, so. that brings me to an interesting conundrum that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. And I, I especially, I especially noticed this when talking, when talking with the, with the, with the, with some of the old TSR f folks, because um, mm -hmm. they had, because they had tried to introduce um, psychic abilities into D and D a handful of times, and none of them stuck. Um, to by their own admission, they couldn't get it, they couldn't get it right, and there's various reasons for that. But what I want to focus on is the fa is the fact that. When a lot of right for whatever reason, there seems to be this weird discrepancy where writers have a very easy time 
implementing a magic system. Very, very easy. And yet, when it comes to implementing rules and limitations for psychic abilities, a lot of writers end up stumbling out of the gate. Now, I don't mean I don't mean to pick on any any writers in particular with this, I'm being broad with it, but if you had to play psychoanalyst about th about that, why would you why would you say it's so much easier for writers to come up with magic systems or the like in fantasy, but they can't but they can't they can't do the same when it comes to psychics. Well, you want when you talk about psychics, do you want to talk about people who predict the future or people who can read minds or people who can move stuff with their minds or all of the above? I'm go I'm go I'm going I'm going broad I'm going broad brush just with the okay. idea of people using some form of psychic powers and it ends up being used as a glorified MacGuffin way too often when it when a, that same writer if he was asked to have somebody who uses magic you don't see this problem as much. Well, because it's easier to define throwing a fireball or lightning than it is for this person can read minds. Uh, congratulations, unless they have the ability to turn on and off like a switch, you know, how many of these people are going to end up in a booby hatch because, or, you know, a cabin far off in the woods because, yeah, he hears he she or it hears voices and can't turn it off and if you're writing that uh you either have to have somebody with a strong off switch otherwise again cabin in the woods mm -hmm. or you know time to become a hermit or you know yes you're going to be listening to everything all the time and with most writers and a lot of readers it's hard enough to just keep track of the thoughts of one character at a time mm -hmm. instead of, oh, look, I've got this character and every character around them. So, and all again, a lot of people don't seem to think of this is how you establish the on-off switch or, gee, there's this thing called mental discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even the Jesuits know that uh, yeah. for 500 years before the 60s happened and then i have no idea what happened to them uh but uh you know so you got to approach psychic abilities with a whole lot of different uh, aspects and you have to think about a lot of different things to go into it and some people just can't do that yeah oddly oddly enough whenever when when i've had this kind of conversation and the and the question the question comes of of a good example of li of limitations. Um, <laughs> as much of a stretch as it is, I end up thinking of a of an old PS one game called Galarians, where one um, psychic abilities were were at were activated through through certain drugs, and two um, overusing them could ca could cause you to could cause the brain to short circuit essentially. Where, a, where the essentially the off switch is broken and everything is coming out like a floodgate. Yeah, and we call this LSD now. <laughs> Look, I don't I don't need LSD to get that experience because I have because I have, I can just rewatch Face of a Frog. Okay. <laughs> oh, but the but. The point the point is is that and yeah some yeah some of some of that is obviously done for the per, for the purposes of it being a game but there's still but even with something like that there's still a degree of verisimilitude and and still a degree of well danger when it comes to using those psychic effects oh, yeah. which is so, which I think is so, I, but so often I kept so often I kept seeing people just use it as oh this per, this person can just do it or the, or they just or they just ha they just happen to uh, they just happen to unlock it or something like that i always think of i always think of say carrie <laughs> yeah Wait. sorry i'm yeah never mind so, sorry carrie is i've got so many problems with that one it's not even funny <laughs> but uh you to a certain degree that's where you want something hard sci-fi to come into play. 
uh, where, yeah, sure. Uh, for example, oh, look, the brain naturally has about a much electrical capacity to run a flashlight battery. And that will generate uh, an electromagnetic field. And if you have thin enough shielding on your own brain, you can start intercepting the thoughts of other people, kind of like an NSA intercept. Uh, I actually use that for one short story that will mm -hmm. probably never see the light of day, come to think of it. But, um, you know, so it can be done. It just, pe some pe I'm guessing some people are just too lazy to do it because it will require a lot of work to make, to make it readable. I think, I think, I do, th I do think that some, in a, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, there's, there's, for the longest time, there's been a, there's been a precedent of, of, of psionics just being a, for lack of a better term, a thing that happens. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of authors who think, who, because, because of the fact that press, that precedent has been set by bigger, by names bigger than them. They think that they don't that they don't have to follow suit. Um, it's it 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 it's what my it's what my mentor would all, would call a self licking ice cream cone. <laughs> but yeah. when it comes, but I but for me personally, I always I always found it I always found it kind of amusing that whenever whenever in some circles, whenever I would try and impl implement um limitations and in, in writing on that on that there would always be that one person who are who argues that that i'm that i'm ter that i'm make that i'm using gamist thinking <laughs> which was all which was always kind of ridiculous look there is nothing wrong about using anything from games or or, or just plain rpgs mm -hmm. uh, in developing a story good lord the entire premise of RPGs is you're telling a story. Mm -hmm. um, heck, there was part of my writing process uh, involved using a role-playing game character generation chart. Uh, I don't mean the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a matter of, hi, this is a chart of things to fill in about your character's biography and backstory and why they have the skills they have mm -hmm. in, in fact uh i use that so much that i could develop characters where i didn't need to plot out the books i i would have uh plot points i want to hit but for the most part you just i just wind up the character and let them go mm -hmm. uh I didn't even need to start using an outline until I got to the St. Tommy novels, and that was mostly because my publisher wanted them. <laughs> you know, they wanted to know that the story had a beginning, middle, and end before I even started writing. And with that, br now that brings me to a few to a few other questions because when you stop and think about it, um. Delving into science fiction and and a science fiction story, um, just set just setting up where that story is going to take place is a series of questions, and the answers to those questions end up providing even more questions. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to delve into into some of those questions. The first one is on the matter of um, of FTL travel. Oh, for that you have. For that, I use the usual shortcut. I'm okay, I don't know how usual it is, but I use hyperspace for the simple reason that it does have a certain kind of sense where if space and time are curved, as a lot of people insist it is, uh, hyperspace is merely the shortcut between two points. Uh, heck, it was technically, you know, it's not exactly folding space like in Dune or, uh, you know, A Wrinkle in Time, but there are similar aspects to it. And frankly, right now, doing Star Trek-like, uh, faster than light travel, e even then, they come up with the loophole of, well, the warp nacelles generate a bubble in which Einsteinian physics no longer works. 
which is really nice uh, until you realize that Einsteinian, Einsteinian physics is now what? Two different levels of physics ago? We're, you know, we're now on quantum mechanics and nobody knows what the hell that does. <laughs> and we're still working that out. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be inter- interesting what happens 20 years down the line, uh, especially now that we're at the point where people are going, well, why are these tablets on Star Trek built so thick? We've got tablets like this thin now. Uh, granted, in that case, I have a very easy explanation, and it's called, this is how you build technology for the military. <laughs> you know, gee, a $300 ashtray that it, it breaks into three blunt pieces. So, you know, if it's on a battleship, it doesn't go flying into the eyes of, you know, glass shards they don't go flying into somebody's eyes while they're piloting a destroyer things like that uh, so yes things out things out in the rim need to be sturdier so they don't break as easy because good lord you could probably break a tablet well no you can break a tablet these days if you sit on it by accident and, as opposed to you know the star trek models yeah and even when it comes when it comes to, I'm pr- I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that um, some di- some diehards of Star Trek will will inevitably get triggered over the over over bringing up the um, M word rega- regarding st- regarding the se- regarding the series because Roddenberry insisted that uh, that a organization that has naval ranks in a naval hierarchy on a ship with weapons is w- who uh, who have orders and if those orders aren't followed you can be court-martialed. Is not a military. Yeah, I, I don't know what I, I don't know what BS he was trying to shovel there. Because anyway, look, if it I'm, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it sure as hell ain't a goose. No kidding. <laughs> but uh, that that's that's another conversation. Mm-hmm. Heck, one of the better parts of Enterprise, and I, good lord, I had to skip like two or three seasons of that show because. I don't know what they were smoking. Like the last season or so, you, you, you had, um, you know, Captain Scott Bakula go, yes, he, he, you know, a new captain is getting a brand new ship and is going, look, don't complain about the weapons. I didn't like them either. I bitched about them to high heaven. But if I didn't have them, we'd all be dead by now. It's it's kind of say, it's kind of saying something that, that that you have to go that you have to reach that far to find something good to say about Enterprise. Kind of praising with faint dams. Well, uh, no season. The last season had some good plots, and they did something weird, like, oh wait, we're a prequel series, right? We could probably set up some of this storyline and cultures. Like, what took you so long? What but, took? Uh, th- I can I can answer that question. What took them so long is Berman and Braga being idiots again. Yeah. Oh, um, yes, Dickless Berman. Yeah, <laughs> the the yeah, I have yet I have yet to hear anyone have nice things to say about Rick Berman. Ditto. Oh. At least, at least with at least with Bra- at least with Braga, you it can be it can be argued he's not he's not evil, he's just an idiot. True. Oh. Um, but the other, but going for going further into that question, one of the bigger questions that I always end up asking whenever delving into any form of science fiction is, what humanity's place in it is. I.e., are we are is it just one faction among many? Are they are they are they a dominant force? Are they somewhere in the middle? Are they at the bottom of the barrel? <laughs> well, in this case, it's more like along the lines of emergent. Because yeah, they're still trying to find their way in the galaxy, but they're they're doing a fairly decent job on kicking ass, mm-hmm. uh, mainly because, <laughs> at least at the start of uh, White Ops Book One, they wind up running into it, they don't kick a hornet's nest. The hornet's nest comes to them, mm-hmm. uh, where the opening premise is yeah, there is an alien race on the march that's trying to take over large parts of the galaxy, and they. 
have run into two primary f forces and you know one is human the other is an alien race called the renar mm -hmm. no they are not space elves honest um and it's a matter of humanity needs to get a massive learning curve and they need to do it right this minute otherwise we're all screwed mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it's less a matter of you know uh what what what, what was that one uh uh, Reddit thread of you know humans the most humans from humanity death fuck planet. yeah that's what it was yes it's less a matter of that and more a matter of yeah we need to get on the learning curve bandwagon this minute or else we're all dead mm -hmm. um, and that's just the prologue of white ops because the first alien invasion is just the prelude yeah and give, given the fact that you mentioned a a essentially a cr essentially a crash course in the what in the wider galaxy. I'm guessing the tech level uh, the tech level of humans is not is not too far advanced from from where from where it is now. Well, it's it's 300 years in the future. I did my best to try to project forward, mm -hmm. um, but I cheated and noted. Yeah, a lot of their advances are recent, especially because once they blew up alien ships, they took the technology and dissected it to reverse engineer it. <laughs> so uh, there are aspects like that. So I could just cheat on, a sh you know, skipping a few steps in technological generation. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of stuff we've got going on now that can very easily be extrapolated forward. You know, we, we have uh, implant, neurological implants uh, that help people work prosthetic limbs. We can 3D print prosthetic limbs. So uh, you, you've got that were given out for free in Britain and that was like six years ago. Mm -hmm. So we've got so much technology at our disposal right now that I'm certain that everything I put in is only going to be 20 years in the future, if that. The, narrow, the, the window keeps narrowing as far as sci-fi to actual technology. I mean, hell, within 10 years of Deep Space Nine having little, uh, little screens on, on, on a lens, it's like we got Google Glasses. Uh, I'm... I uh, I live in dread of what neurological implants are going to look like, because there's so many different ways those can go wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, if you come up with a process that makes neurological implants as easy as getting your teeth cleaned, uh, and oh look, you can plug into the internet from there via by a wireless, or you know. You, you, you carry the wireless antenna on your person somewhere and it reacts with your interfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, oh God, I can't imagine what that's going to do. But uh, so you have things like that in, in white ops. I have a toss up between how much technology is implanted and how much technology is, um, is part of the kit. Uh, I wound up with using a lot of, uh, heads-up display contact lenses, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's just a matter, you know, the technology is not really in the contact lenses itself. It's built into sensors within the uniforms, for example. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of that is not that far off. There is a, what is it, digital camouflage, where you take fiber optic cameras on one end, you have projections on the other end, so you basically have a cloaking technology. Yeah. I, I know people made fun of the invisible car in uh, the last Pierce Brosnan James Bond movie, but that was emerging technology at the time. And they just don't talk about it a hell, hell of a lot because it looks goofy, but it's real, which should scare people. Yeah. Uh, I, um, so. I remember, I remember, I'm, um... I remember the when you meant when you mentioned digital camouflage I my mind instantly goes to that goes to the did goes to the um 
UCP experiment that the that the army tried doing a few years back that and that was <laughs> that was hated by pretty much everybody oh okay UCP was universal camo pattern the idea what the oh. idea was the, was a digital camo pattern <laughs> yeah that that I, I don't yeah I never got that it just struck me as idiotic it's like guys it's not doing much better than your regular camo and it only looks like you just ran it through a dot matrix printer yeah like, especially since it it only seems to blend in with that with that one ugly couch that was used as a that was used as a meme image for years uh-huh that's so if you so if you're sitting on that couch you'll bl you'll blend in but <laughs> And but if you're actually out in some some place that matters, it's not gonna work. One, it's not gonna work, and two, maintaining the thing was a royal pain, um, because because of the because of the fact that you that trying trying to wash the thing, you had to do special you had to do special things. Oh, the whole the whole thing cost several billion dollars, and it and after that. A a rule was passed that the army was no longer no longer allowed to just develop their own camo like that. <laughs> I.e. Yeah. You suck so much. We we need we need to make it illegal for you to suck as hard as you do. <laughs> uh, but give now given the, given that would it be fair of me, would it be fair of me to say that relation. That um human and a human and alien re relations, um aren't aren't in the extreme end of th end of things. Define extreme. Um, in term in terms of in terms of humans having extreme xenophobia. For instance. Uh, no, mainly because by this point it, it just. No, in fact, there are alien races that are more xenophobic, and it's less it's less a matter of xenophobic and more a matter of. We want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. Please leave us the hell alone. If you don't leave us alone, we will have to kill you. Um, and in, in fact, I have a plot, a world developing point where, uh, yeah, aliens actually drop by Earth somewhere around 2050. And, uh, you know, this alien race likes robes in various and sundry uh, patterns and fashions. And... Uh, you know, they scanned Earth for a while, and, okay, well, we found a centrally located principality. Uh, guy wears right, white robes like members of our religious uh, factions. Uh, he seems to have international relationships with everybody else on the planet. Uh, this guy must rule this planet. <laughs> so uh, the Renar land in St. Peter's Square in the dead of night uh, and, and says, hi, take us to your leader. He's called the Pope, right? Um, at which point it's like, uh, can you park around back? Uh, then follow me. <laughs> and it, the, the, the final conclusion after consulting with people is uh, you might not want to... Uh, you might not want to out yourself just yet. We have no idea how people are going to react. Uh, you're, you're not kidnapping people and leaving crop circles, are you? No? Good. Just, just checking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, the Renar will wind up taking parts away of Earth culture. Uh, uh, one is the premise of philanthropic, uh, well philanthropic uh, mercenaries where, yes, we are going to do good, uh, you know, on Earth, the premise is, yes, we will do good, we will kill terrorists, then we will steal their money. Uh, and, you know, the Renar hear this and go, so, you know, and basically they turn it into the concept of space paladins. And uh, they, pay, they hear a lot of Catholic theology and they, and their religious section goes, okay, well, we worked up, we ourselves worked up to this person you call Aristotle, but you have some interesting expansions on the concept, and we'll be happy to take that with us for further study. You know, things along those lines. So, 
no, there's not a lot of xenophobia. And it will come up as a plot point because you're going to have politicians who are going to try to use it in order to stoke fear and get and gain more control. Because now, granted, I know that's outlandish. Who has ever heard of a politician using fear in order to gain more dictatorial control over a population? I've never heard of any such thing. Have you? Yes, I know. I'm kidding. Um, and we won't need to go into any examples if you've studied history for five minutes. But um, that's really the only context in which it comes up. Because, I'm sorry, I, I have problems seeing 300 years into the future where we get to the point where, yes, we're in outer space and we still have the space clan. Some things never change. Yeah, but... Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I didn't think the Ku Klux Klan worked as an antagonist when Sherlock Holmes used them. So uh, try, trying to expand that far into the future just seems like a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And besides, in, in terms of using space paladins versus the clan it's like this is going to be a five minute confrontation we need a better we need, we need better bad guys mm -hmm. so i wound up with well cannibalistics intergalactic mongol hordes so you know i figured they worked yeah now one i think i'd be remiss if i didn't if i didn't bring up one final thing like when in the in in part of, in part of that little tagline when you, when advertising it, there's the no, there's a note of when black ops aren't enough, you need white ops. Most people are gonna know what black ops are in one form or another just from just just from the cult, the cultural zeitgeist. What would be the key difference between black ops and white ops? Because with most black bag operations, they're secret in part. Because if they came out, it would be embarrassing for all concerned. Uh, white ops are, yes, we are secret for the simple reason that we don't want the bad guys to know that we're onto them. But uh, yes, if you expose these out into the daylight, nobody would have any problem with them. Uh, it originally started as a matter of, uh, you know, we're going to be fighting a war in the shadows or, you know, you know, army of light tropes. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we're going to have uh, spec ops called white ops. Um, one of the taglines I've been using, has, at least when I'm developing tweets, was, uh, you know, yes, they're going to be fighting in the shadows and they will bring the light, even if it comes with nuclear bombs. <laughs> yeah, it may, it may come, it may come through nukes, but um, well, the, well, the targets were probably Capellans, so I don't feel bad. Uh, yeah, well, I, I you, you can probably just say, um, you know, use the Babylon Five term "shadows" if you wanted. Mm -hmm. But uh, especially since I I found them one of the scarier bad guys and decided, how can I make them? How you know? How could I make the scariest alien villains I can come up with even worse? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and for those of you who watch Babylon Five. No, the solution is not going to be a matter of daddy issues. Uh, that was probably my only problem with that series up to season four. We won't talk about season five. No one does. Although in that, although in that regard, I hope, I hope to God you haven't you haven't considered putting in a, a your own version of Mister Morden. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> actually, I wound up stealing. No. Yeah, I kind of wound up stealing uh, Lord of the Rings because the premise for the bad guys uh, are, yes, they have come in from a different galaxy. They've been largely in hibernation that long. And um, they're slowly feeling their way out. Uh, they, they arm the opening alien invasion with high-tech toys to see who stops them. Mm -hmm. And in order to cover uh, their tracks, uh, the opening alien fleet, 
their home world is taken out by a very convenient supernova. And as they send minions out to uh, feel, feel their way through, they have the ability to basically act like the one ring. And they have a type of uh, yeah, psychic ability, let's go that way, where it's coaxing and tempting and basically going, yes, y y you can have all the power you want and let's give you some hints here and there. Uh, you know, the, the premise with the one ring is, yes, there's darkness in everybody and the ring will eventually get to it one way or another. Uh, in this case, it's a matter of, yeah, sure, all you really need to do is find a politician who's willing to do all sorts of utterly horrific things in order to uh, advance themselves. Gee, it's not like we can't find some of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not at all, not at all. You know, um, oh, look, these two galactic empires have been going at each other for a few hundred years. They just kind of expanded into one another. Uh, let's flip a coin and see which one we help the most in order to, uh, you know, spread more chaos and weaken yet another faction. Things like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, uh, one early reader basically read uh, the early the, the drafts and went, did you throw in every?" every piece of knowledge you ever picked up somewhere along the way and threw it into this book? And the answer is yes. Isn't that what every author does? Uh, okay, I'm being not, facetious, but still. Hey, it, 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 well, some people, some of us have to still do research. Uh, that's That was my St. Tommy series, where it was weaponized research, and I had to look up charisms of saints, because... You look at these things and they look like superpowers between levitation, bilocation, smelling evil, healing, uh, raising people from the dead. Uh, you know, it's like you just throw a cape on these people and see them fight crime, uh, which is basically how I wound up developing the series. Uh, and in order to develop more of that, uh, gee, I want uh, my first bad guy to be a possessed serial killer. So it's like... Okay, read Father Amorth, the uh, exorcist out of the Vatican, uh, two of his books, uh, a book called The Right on current events within exorcism, and, uh, oh yeah, here's a book on demonic infestations. <laughs> you know, things along those lines, and all that research winds up going into the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I Thankfully, I did not have digital copies of these books, otherwise I would have been tempted to copy and paste passages which would have gotten me in real trouble. But, um, you know, so yeah, sometimes it's a matter of, yes, I'm an information sponge and I'm just going to pour out everything into this series versus crap, I actually need to find something out because I don't know everything yet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the meme that goes around out of uh, Avengers, when did you become an expert in particle physics last night? You know, <laughs> Congratulations, that is every single writer, <laughs> you know, trying to work on a new project where they know just enough to go, hey, that's cool. Uh, and then they have to read like five or six books just to figure out how the hell they, how the hell mechanics work. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't try to go into a lot of hard sci-fi and because I don't want to turn into Time Magazine or um, where, you know, the articles cover just enough that if you are an expert in the field, you're going, but how does this work? Um, and you drive yourself crazy. I don't want to wind up going into hard science fiction and then have uh, some guy who's a PhD in physics, I know like two or three of them, go, okay, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Okay, stop. I don't, I don't want to know. So uh, sometimes hand waving them is just what you need in order to bypass people sending you angry letters and writing one star reviews because you, you know, didn't get the ampage right <laughs> or how much volts go through X in order to achieve Y result. 
Yeah, as some as somebody who's had, I've had my fair, I've had my fair share of experiences with that mindset. Um, just just within just within um. Just with just within the HEMA crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But. But. What um what are you shooting for as far as a as far as a release time for the first book? First book is January eighteenth. Mm -hmm. Um, February the February release I think is the fifteenth. I don't know which one the March is. It's probably also somewhere in the Ides of, but uh, yeah, actually I would have to look them up. Mm -hmm. But um, thankfully, uh, for if if. If you have people within your audience who absolutely refuse to give any money to Amazon ever again, a sentiment which I can wholeheartedly agree with and understand, uh, these books are, quote, going wide, and they are on almost every available platform that I know of. Uh, they should be on everything from Nook to Apple Books, uh, but Apple Books and Google Play don't have them yet, so get back to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and also there's going to be hard cop, hard cover and paperback editions. Again, they're not out yet. So, um, but no, it, it's going to be available on almost all platforms and in all formats uh, as much as we can put together uh, because Tuscany Bay does not believe in the, Amazon is the only game out there because they've seen too much of what Amazon does, you know. Mm -hmm. There have been entire authors who have been disappeared because Amazon just didn't like them. And Tuscany Bay really does not want to play those games. Mm -hmm. And I, I will I would look forward to seeing how, how it de how it develops as well as well as as well as laughing at whoever decides to pick a realism fight again because I know I know what's gonna happen. I just I just know that I'm gonna laugh when it when it does when it does happen because as Napoleon is attributed to saying, never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. Amen. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come up to come all the way to the temple and enjoy the madness that play here. No, oh, of course, anytime. It's always fun. And and as anytime you wish to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. Amen. Thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>